Hey there, thanks for tuning in to another episode of EMS Leads. Sorry it's been a little while. Uh, our family welcomed a newborn a couple weeks ago, so life has been very busy leading up to that and uh, in the time since, obviously. So wanted to kind of get together again, put something up just because it's been so long, like I said, and wanted to do a literature review. You know, the previous literature review you did of cardiac arrest was kind of an overview of the whole cardiac arrest literature, but this is more in the spirit of what I'm hoping to do in the future with literature uh, reviews, which is pick a study and just kind of break down what they did in about as little math and research lingo as possible, but more just kind of what was the question, why were they doing it, how did they do it, and any big important things we can take away from it as an EMS community. So for anyone that knows me or has worked with me, they know that I have a very healthy respect and love of the airway and so I like to talk about it whenever I can and just really think it's very important that in the medical community we are masters of the airway. I think this is one of the two ways that if we mismanage it we actively kill people rather than just prevent whatever disease process is already happening. Um, not able to control an airway is a catastrophe and one of the greatest failures we can have with patients. So I think studies like this are so important to talk about because they add a lot of tools in our arsenal of how to better optimize airway control, both for the pre-hospital provider and for the emergency room physician uh, or other provider. That said, the pre-day trial itself is gonna be geared towards pre-hospital airway. And so when I am teaching uh, different EMS students or kind of doing any sort of review with paramedics or any sort of EMS provider, I like to talk about the airway in the sense of triaging it, just like we do with everything else. We deal with the life threats. Well, when we're getting to an airway, we like to triage of difficulty. So is this going to be an easy one, moderately difficult, or very difficult? And based on what we anticipate and based on what we evaluate, that will help us know what to prepare for. So we're going to kind of review this trial and then talk about the suggested approach based on this trial of how we should triage an airway and go about our treatment. And then I'm going to talk about a few other quick um, airway studies from the past couple years that kind of put this into context and add some other small tidbits of information. So this is the actual study. Um, if you look it up on PubMed, on even probably Google, um, you'll find it. It was from June of 2017 in the Western Journal of Emergency Medicine. I read this in fellowship and it really changed my practice and it helps me when I'm evaluating patients and about to treat their airway and as well as how I teach uh, students and providers to triage an airway. So as we all know, pre-hospital airway management is a critical part of our care. We're taught multiple different things depending on the level and scope of practice that you have. We have the airway adjuncts, the uh, bag valve, uh, mask, the supraglottic airways, and intubation. And then pre-hospital intubation overall is one of the most common procedures done uh, with a success rate of about 77%. Now that number is exceedingly high. Uh, I don't know where they got 77%, but that is the success rate that is um, used in this study. The numbers that I've seen in various textbooks and in various studies is usually around 50 or 60%. But I think it just depends on if you're looking at first pass success versus total success eventually. You know, if you intubated them after nine attempts, that's still considered a success if you're looking at just the binary yes, no success. Um, and as we'll talk about later, one of the issues with this approach is that we know after the first pass, every subsequent attempt increases morbidity and mortality in patients. So the really important statistic is what is the first pass success rate. Now pre-hospital intubation specifically is uh, the subject of a huge debate. It's one of the biggest debates that we see as I've talked about in other podcasts. You know the the National EMS Physicians Association meeting that we have every year is always headlined by the big debate of a group that thinks supraglottic airways are the way to control an airway and another group that say intubation is. And they go about this back and forth and we'll touch on that a very little bit. Um, but regardless, airway control is vital as we've talked about. And there's multiple factors in the field that make pre-hospital intubation more difficult than in a controlled hospital setting. So in the ER, I have me, usually a resident, at least one resident, 
multiple nurses, possibly a paramedic, a respiratory therapist, an anesthesiologist if needed, an otolaryngologist if needed. We have multiple sets of backup, multiple types of video laryngoscopy, multiple adjuncts. In the field, it can be you and your partner, depending on your service. You have varied amounts of light, of equipment, of personnel, of experience. And overall, statistically, they have found that pre-hospital intubation, when compared to hospital intubation, requires more attempts. And as we've seen in hospital-based literature, the pre-hospital literature agrees that every attempt decreases the likelihood of success and increases the likelihood of adverse events. So when we're talking about adverse events, the big three that um, come with any intubation but are most associated with the biggest issues are hypoxia and bradycardia, which ultimately result in death if not controlled. So when we're looking at factors that could be involved, we're looking at two types, the environmental and the patient factors. The environmental factors kind of are dealing with the scene, the location you're in, the position of the patient, the position you'll be in, um, the equipment available, the personnel available, and are there spectators around? Is this on the side of an interstate with multiple cars around? Are there cameras around? That kind of thing. And then the patient factors are, do we know the patient's history? Do we know their comorbidities? What specific anatomic issues could be related to your success and could affect things? So when we're looking at how to manage an airway, we've learned about supraglottic airways as becoming pretty much equivalent to endotracheal tubes, as well as bag valve masks, which are used to oxygenate the patient with positive pressure. And these are very valuable skills. You know, I tell our EMS students that when they're going to the operating room to practice intubating, they should spend just as much time um, trying to mask patients and bag them because that is a skill that saves lives. Because if you fail an intubation, between each attempt, when you pull the laryngoscope out, you need to be able to bag them. It's when you can't bag them that you really get into a tough, tough situation. And so uh, the better you are at bagging, um, I encourage all of you out there to be mastering and uh, your skill, but also learning how to troubleshoot a bad seal. Um, how can I fix it so that my masking is more efficient? Because I think that's one of the most important skills as medical providers in an emergency setting that we possess. Um, and so when I was a paramedic and when I was in EMS school, one of the, the cultures was kind of here, we're going to teach you how to intubate, which is why you're a paramedic. That's the big deal. And if you fail an intubation, then you can bag them or use a supraglottic airway. So who in the world is going to want to grab their uh, supraglottic airway when the whole culture attached to it is it's only after you failed? Who wants to embrace that failure? Nobody. And so we really have to continue as medical directors, as educators, and as providers on the front lines that are up to date on literature, we have to be encouraging our providers to use the tools available. Supraglottic airways are not inferior. Study after study shows there is no harm with using a supraglottic airway. I have sent two patients to the ICU with a supraglottic airway. And aside from the fact that none of them up there knew what to do with it, the patient had no adverse events. In fact, a lot of the literature, there's concern that endotracheal tubes can be causing damage. Again, not because of anything about the tube, but just because of some of the circumstances around putting it in. But more importantly, um, Based on supraglottic airway, previous culture, and where we're trying to get to now, one of the big questions is, is there a group of people that the supraglottic airway should be your first line, even in the um, agencies that can intubate? And the big answer that all literature agrees on is yes. Anyone that's in anticipated difficult airway should have a supraglottic airway because patients with difficult airways, which is defined differently in different literature, but subjectively difficult airways have poorer outcomes when they undergo endotracheal tube intubation. So the question that this study is trying to answer is how do we identify these people? And so the point is they're trying to identify high-risk patients that would benefit from avoiding endotracheal tube intubation because this should hopefully decrease the risk that can be associated with multiple or prolonged attempts at um, intubation. So kind of in the 
literature review of this study specifically, they talk about some of the previous findings and a lot of the different studies that found different factors associated with difficult intubation were done, not just in the pre-hospital setting. They were done um, somewhere in the field in other countries, some were in emergency departments, some in the ICU, some with anesthesia. But overall, they all found factors that were associated with difficult airways, but there were so many of them that no one is going to remember them all. And so it's hard to know what to do with that data other than in the aftermath, you can go, oh yeah, they did have a lot of those on the checklist, but that's not a checklist that's super effective. And there are um, different predictors of difficult airways and different treatment pathways that have been proposed. But prior to this study, there had been no externally validated and simplified tools to identify the right patients for pre-hospital providers to predict difficult airways and make a plan accordingly. So the objective of this trial, as stated in the paper, is to prospectively derive and validate a tool to identify difficult intubation in the pre-hospital setting. And then this tool would hopefully act uh, to guide pre-hospital airway interventions. Now, just very quickly going into the study design, just so you understand how they did it. Again, I am by no means an academic and am not a research-oriented person, so a lot of this I had to simplify as much as possible for myself. So this is prospective and observational. So what that means is it's prospective. So when the study started, that was time zero, and they were gonna be now measuring this moving forward. This was not something that had already been done, and they were now just looking back at some time period from five years ago of you know, the exposure that they were evaluating and the outcome they were looking at. This was something where they were defining exposures, defining the outcome, and then from time zero moving forward, were um, going to study it. Now, observational, as you know, it means to observe. The big point here is that there was no direct intervention on the population that they were monitoring. So they knew the group, they knew the outcomes they were looking for, and they were looking to identify risk factors, but there was no direct intervention. It wasn't like they were giving some group a medication, some group not, some group a airway tool, others not. They were just seeing how agencies worked in this observational study without interfering to affect the outcome. So the study involved 16 ground EMS agencies that were both rural and urban. So there were no air EMS agencies, which is also important as that often brings different skill sets, times, constraints, and equipment. It involved 10 county regional EMS systems responding to 100,000 calls a year in Pennsylvania. Um, these were all ALS units that were staffed with one paramedic, one EMT basic. And they had annual hands-on airway skills assessment didactics that were one or two hours a year, and they all averaged about one or two intubations a year. Now, depending on where you are, that is actually, I thought, very uh, comparable to at least around here in the Midwest, um, the numbers that we would see. I think the majority of EMS providers in at least urban settings around here are getting one or two intubations a year. Obviously, some have more, some have less, I think that's a fair average. And I think while airway control in and of itself has more hours of didactics, specifically just practicing intubation is probably one or two hours a year. I think that's fair. So I think this is good data. It's not like this agency was doing 10 hours when no one else is, so of course they're good at it, or doing zero training, so of course they're worse at it. I think this is a very comparable amount of training. Um, they were following their state protocols that had no RSI or sedation assisted intubation. This is very similar to how things are done in Iowa, specifically in uh, the agency that I work with. Um, and in cardiac arrest, they must do basic airway interventions for 10 minutes prior to the advanced airway. And this is actually how we run our codes as well um, in the agency I work with, is they do passive ventilation for at least six to eight minutes. Um, just based on some other literature in that pit crew model that we've talked about. So now, how do you get included in the study or excluded? So um, you were included, your chart was included if there was an advanced procedure done, obviously, which would be supraglottic airway or intubation. And if this custom form that was created for this study is embedded in your provider chart. So this custom form had to be done for a chart to be finalized. So 
it's one of those things where you would write your note, you would write your narrative, fill out all your check boxes, but before you could uh, finalize your chart to be submitted, it had this custom form. So whether you wanted to or not, if you did an advanced airway procedure, you needed to complete this form. And the point of this was that they wanted to catch all of them and really not let any fall through the cracks. So the things in this custom form included patient demographics, patient characteristics, difficult airway features that the provider encountered, procedural characteristics, you know, did you have to pre-oxygenate extra? Did you have to do multiple attempts? Did you have to change positions? And then any techniques used to intubate. So video laryngoscopy, bougie, cricoid pressure, all those kinds of things. And then uh, patients were excluded if you didn't know how many intubations attempts there were, if they had to do a nasal tracheal intubation, and if they use supraglottic airway first. So this is kind of, the point of this is that while they talk about advanced airway being either, the point of this is still with the understanding that the intubation is first line. This study is not trying to make a stand about what kind of advanced airway to use. It's talking about in light of the fact that this agency uses intubation, let's see what difficult factors were encountered. And then for the patient's safety as second line, they would use a supraglottic. So here's just some definitions that were used throughout the study. Just if you choose to read this on your own, you kind of understand how they're defining things. So a difficult intubation, and this should be something that you should really consider um, in your own practice, but obviously, you know, every EMS agency is unique, but it's considered a difficult intubation if it required more than two attempts at laryngoscopy. And I would kind of put the caveat that the laryngoscopy for the purpose of placing a tube in, you know, often we'll use laryngoscopy if we think there's a choking to look for a foreign body. I don't consider that an intubation attempt. Um, I have colleagues that would disagree with me because the point is that during that time, you're not oxygenating them. But for the purpose of this study, you know, because they excluded a lot of other people, including chokings, I believe. Um, the point of this is that they're assuming that you're putting a laryngoscope into their mouth with the purpose of intubating. So more than two attempts in this is considered difficult. The other thing that they call difficult would be one attempt at laryngoscopy and then moving on to supraglottic airway or just straight bagging. And so based on previous work, they used kind of the most frequently found um, difficult airway characteristics that were considered. So they went through all the literature they found in all the different things, um, different studies that they read, okay, what different features have been found to be associated with difficult airways. And they tried to pick a bunch of them with the purpose of now in this study, trying to find what combination of these difficult factors would maximize identification of bad airways as defined here, the more than two attempts at laryngoscopy or one attempt and then supraglottic or BVM. So the providers that were in the study were not told the definition of difficult intubation because they were afraid that if they um, told them that it could affect how they do things. You know, if they're on the border of deciding, do I look for a third time or not? They thought that maybe understanding what the outcomes being measured were would have an effect on their care, which is not what they wanted. So providers were not told the definition, but were just told to report the number of laryngoscope attempts and the device ultimately placed. Um, so when you look at these difficult airway characteristics that were used, that they were going to use some combination of, it was GCS of greater than three, which makes sense, limited neck movement for either um, because of a C-collar or, quote, other, presence of a gag reflex, the presence of trismus or a clenched jaw, obvious neck or facial trauma, inability to palpate neck landmarks, which were the cricoid cartilage and thyromental distance, and then any fluid in the airway. And so then they compared data on these feet, the presence of these features between airways that were defined by their definition as difficult or as not. So then after this, besides doing their custom form, providers would answer questions. And so um, provider was ultimately asked if they felt the intubation was difficult. They had to report the number of attempts, again, not knowing the definition of what the study was calling a difficult intubation classify the location of the attempts, were you in the ambulance, on scene, or on and off the stretcher, and then broadly categorize the status of the patient and indication for intubation. So they were asked the age. If the patient age was unknown, they had to estimate to the nearest decade. If the, they had to do the weight, if the weight was unknown, um, 
they had to just estimate the best they could. And there's actually literature that shows that EMS can reliably estimate a patient's weight within about 20% of the actual weight. So they really wanted a weight. And the reason this is important is because one of the universal things that we know in EMS literature related to airway is that obesity is a huge risk factor and so um, for a difficult airway. So the patient's weight was vital. Um, every attempt, when they asked the providers to say how many attempts did you try, the study people defined an attempt as any time the laryngoscope went past the lips. And then when they say the status of the patient, they mean was this a cardiac or traumatic arrest? Was this a medical condition that was not arresting or a trauma condition not arresting? And then just in terms of statistics, you understand in these kinds of observational things where you're not intervening, there's going to be some amount of error. Um, and so, you know, between missing data, different people filling out the forms wrong, you know, human error, that kind of thing. So they made the statistical assumption of error. So basically they said, we know there's going to be mistakes made because this is observational. Um, and so we're going to allow a certain amount of error to be brought into our study. So we're going to assume 10% of the data will be missing and that at least 20% of the airways that we measure will be considered difficult. And these were numbers based on previous studies. So because of those, that helped them then know, based on their statistical testing, how many patient cases they would have to evaluate to adequately review the 10 variables they were looking at, which is a really smart way to do that. Um, cause the worst thing you could do is set up this beautiful study and then you look at a hundred intubations and only five of them were actually difficult meeting your criteria. Well, you don't nearly have enough cases, obviously. So to kind of define ahead of time, how many you think there will be plus leaving room for error, it really makes sure you have overkill of cases. So now we kind of get into the statistics and the research that I can't offer a ton of insight into. And I don't think frankly, or why you're here or how it's going to affect too much of what you're doing, but basically some math was done. They knew the variables that had been shown in the past to be associated with difficult intubation. And so the point here was both individually to figure out what var variables were associated with the greatest likelihood to predict this difficult airway, but then more importantly, what combination of these variables would. And so they picked all different combinations of these variables to maximize the specificity. And so specificity is the ability of a test and in this case, the, the combination of variables to correctly identify those without disease. So specificity actually tells you true negatives. So if they have a negative here, so if they are not, according to this, with a good specificity, if they do not meet the criteria for a difficult airway, they do not have a difficult airway. So we're always seeking 100% specificity because that means there are no false negatives. They are all true negatives. So you're never gonna have, I'm sorry, there's gonna be no false positives because a false positive would say, yes, it's a difficult airway, but it wasn't. But because with 100% specificity, you've already caught all the negatives, there can't, all the true negatives, there can't be any false positives. And so this is a great rule in test, very highly specific um, tests rule diseases in or problems in. So in this case, highly specific combination of variables means it, that if you are deemed to have a difficult airway, it's, it is a difficult airway. Hope that makes sense. This is one of the more complicated things. The point is just they wanted high specificity because the higher a test specificity is, the more you can rule it in whatever disease you're looking for. So the higher specificity this combination of variables had, the higher likelihood of identifying difficult airways. That was the point. So they found the right combination of variables to maximize the prediction ability. And they used this derivation set. So the, they derived the rule from their first round and then they applied the rule to another set, and that's called the validation set, to still make sure they were getting the same results and it wasn't some unmeasured thing in this first set that they looked at of data. Um, one of the other things, just as a side note, because that's kind of its own um, topic in uh, pre-hospital medicine is 
they looked at the variables alone and in combination, and then they also looked at pediatric, including pediatrics or removing pediatrics to see if there's something about the pediatric population that affects things. So ultimately, they used 1,102 cases after reviewing 1,294. Um, and so the derivation of validation sets have very cynical, similar difficult intubation proportions. Both had from 25 to 27%, which is good, which means that both populations had the same proportion of difficult airways. It's not like one had 90% difficult airways and one had 20, which would completely skew the data. and They would be uncomparable. Most cases were managed with intubation on the first attempt, um, but about one in five were ultimately managed with a supraglottic airway. So 20% required a supraglottic, which is about comparable to the national data. What they did find universally was that the proportions of patients over 150 kilograms, which is over 300 pounds, were higher in difficult um, intubation compared to not difficult. And this kind of makes sense. We know that, as we said, obesity is a huge risk factor for a difficult airway. But what this should mean to you is that the weight of a patient should be part of every airway evaluation. Every patient that you are considering intervening on their airway, you have to evaluate their weight and their risk of obesity. Because um, even in this patient, even when their age, status as defined before, and location of the attempt were similar in the two groups, the fact that they were 150 kilos when every other thing was deemed equal, they were still more over 150 kilos in the difficult airway group. That's huge, and that's very important to know. You can't blame it on the location, how sick the patient was, or their age. The weight is a huge variable when managing the pre-hospital airway. And then obviously the difficult airway patients as identified by their definition earlier, had more difficult airway characteristics that we'll, initiate, we'll use the initial DAC for that. So overall, again, they had 10 variables from previous literature. They were looking for a combo now. Multiple variables were associated with difficult intubation, but five factors were most predictive. So the, this OR in the um, parentheses is called an odds ratio. And so essentially what they were measuring was it's the odds of an outcome occurring with a given variable. So this is meant compared to chance. So an odds ratio of one means the variable did not affect things and it had an equal chance of causing whatever outcome we're looking for here, the presence of a difficult intubation as chance would have had. So when a GCS was over three, that meant that the presence of GCS over three was two times more likely to be associated than chance. Limited airway movement and trismus jaw clenching had an odds ratio of 2.25. Inability to palpate landmarks was almost six times more concerning, um, more associated with a difficult airway compared to chance, and then fluid in the oropharynx about 2.25. So these are huge variables. And so while there's not much to know offhand, these are five variables that I would know and I would be considering in every patient when you're starting to figure out your own airway triage. And so we talked about specificity already. So again, the closer to 100% means the less false positives so that you're catching all the negatives so that anything else you have is a true positive. So in the derivation group, if there were at least two factors present, that was 91.5% specific. And in the validation group, it was about 87.7%. So there was a little bit of a gap there. But if at least three factors were present in both groups, they were over 98% specific. And that is the key takeaway of this whole study is these five factors are very predictive of a difficult airway. If at least three of them are present, then it's over 98% specific to a difficult airway. So um, the other thing they found, I should say, in this section is that, as I said before, they took out the pediatric patients and included them to see if that changed the numbers. It did not change the values. This associations are true in pediatrics or not. So as we've talked about, pre-hospital intubations can be complicated by the environment with those factors we talked about, provider experience. You know, if you're on your second day of work, having only ever done EMS school intubations, or you're in your 30th year, that can affect things. And then as well as the illness of the patient. Can they handle 
bradycardia or hypotension that can happen from the laryngoscope? Can they handle hypoxia? Do they have much reserve such that they become hypoxic very quickly? All these factors are very important. And this is the first study that gave a tool for pre-hospital providers specifically. And this overall found, um, this gave EMS providers a tool to predict difficult airways with over 87% specificity if at least two factors were present and over 98% specificity if at least three factors were present. Other studies have found multiple variables associated with difficult intubation, but this study did not include them all. That doesn't mean they don't contribute. And that's a key point I wanna to make too. So there are other things that in isolation have been found to cause problems. Some were mentioned in this study like blood or vomit in the airway, C-spine immobilization, um, facial trauma, but there are some other things that we know that are problems. Limited malum potty scores, you know, that 332 rule, if you don't have those, that's going to be a problem. Large tongues can be a problem, airway edema, short mandibles, short neck, and obesity. There are some things that need to be assessed on all patients, and this study was not just identifying all variables associated with a difficult airway. I want that to be clear. There are some things that we need to be measuring on every single patient. Do they have a gag reflex? Do they have history of difficult intubation? Are they obese? Do they have COPD? Those kinds of things. Those are things we have to know on every patient. The study here was to identify the best combination of other factors that could be used as an additional tool as you're deciding, what am I gonna do with this patient? So there's still gonna be difficult airways that you encounter live. This. Um, this tool is not gonna be your end all be all. This is just something that as you're arriving on scene, as you're accumulating information, and as you're evaluating patients, it can help you identify things. Obviously, you still need to always be ready. Um, of note here, of the difficult airways that were in the validation group, 30% had none of the risk factors. So you can't identify every difficult airway. Um, so you always should anticipate challenges and have all your alternatives ready. I always tell our residents and EMS students that you should have three plans for an advanced airway. Your first line plan, if that goes wrong, you're gonna pull out, bag them again, what's your second plan? And then the second plan, something has to have changed. You can't attempt an advanced airway the same way twice. And then the third attempt, you have to change something again. And so always have, have um, alternatives ready and make sure everyone is on the same page. So there were some limitations in this study too. Um, they had to do a form to complete their note. So providers knew that there was a study in progress and this could affect, you know, if, if they're doing something about intubation and I just said I did five attempts, is that gonna mess with things? Maybe I'll fudge the numbers, that kind of thing. Um, potentially, they may have only said it was difficult if they had multiple attempts. There was probably a little bit of bias in that the providers could have affected if they defined the airway as difficult since they didn't know how the study defined it. Um, there's also many variables that have already been, the variables they use have already been shown to be associated with difficult airways, but there could have also been factors affecting the difficult airways in this study that weren't measured. For example, we don't know how many of these were by the interstate. We don't know the position. Maybe they repeatedly had to do these things prone or tomahawking. We don't know, and that we couldn't measure there. Um, there were also multiple agencies involved, so don't know what airway applied to what agency. So could there be one of those um, agencies that's just especially not very good at intubation? Could it have been the same patient multiple times? Those are kinds of things that we couldn't measure the way they uh, performed the study. Um, that said, as well, providers didn't have RSI, and so how do we use the data here when you do have RSI? Which of these factors, especially in combination, maybe would be um, minimized or not as important if you suddenly had paralytics involved? And then we didn't collect data on those where the supraglottic or BVM were first line. That was who was excluded. And I think this was um, right around the time that a couple big landmark airway studies came out showing supraglottic airways were uh, non-inferior to intubation. This was still with the supposition that intubation is first line and supraglottic is second line. So it would be interesting to see, you know, of those patients excluded because they got a supraglottic airway first, how many of those did the provider just have identified as a difficult airway and maybe he had 
he or she had taken them out of the study without knowing it because they had already assessed and decided this would be difficult. Let's do a superglottic and just get there. Um, there's still more populations we need to evaluate further. They generally look to pediatrics, but they are kind of their own airway literature group. Um, and then the majority of these patients that were intubated were in cardiac arrest. So there was limited assessment that information that was given if the patient was not in cardiac arrest, because there were very few patients that were in that trauma or medical, but not arresting group that were intubated. And we don't really know what features they had. So how do we use this now that we have this study? So this is a tool to use before you attempt to intubate. Um, there's still things you need to be looking at each time. As we talked about the patient's weight, do they have a gag reflex? What's the environment like? Do I have enough light? Do I have enough equipment? Do I have enough experience? Is the most experienced provider doing this? There's still things you need to do to optimize the airway regardless of intubation. They have airway adjuncts. You need to be pre-oxygenating them, positioning them, all these things, have multiple plans ready. But it does help you triage the airway. So if this person has at least two or three of the factors mentioned above, very high likelihood that they have a difficult airway. So first you should ask yourself, is this someone that needs to be intubated at all? Especially now that we know that we have adjuncts that are equally effective with less of the um, negative sequelae after. Is there another option that's better first line? Should we just bag them all the way? Should we do an adjunct? Should we do supraglottic? Should I be the one to intubate? Is there more experience around? I think this is a hard question to ask yourself, but you know, it goes back to that debate of, well, if I don't want enough experience and I'm giving it up to more experienced people, how do I gain the experience? And that's, that's kind of the question. And that's the, you know, that's the catch 22 of this, but I think you at least need to have your most experienced person present um, and have some self-awareness and leave ego at the door to understand it's about the patient and their safety. Um, and so is this someone not just should I intubate or should someone more experienced intubate? Should anyone intubate this patient? Would the patient be optimized in an operating room? I think of pediatric epiglottitis. I think of, you know, patients with Ludwig's angina um, who just have really friable tissue, really angry tissue that could be really reactive. Um, should anyone be intubating or should they be using a fiber optic in the ED or something like that? And then do I have any other um, tools at my disposal or can I call someone? You know, in our area, we have a air ambulance group that can get to us pretty quickly. And besides just their aircraft, they come with a lot of expertise as well as equipment, video laryngoscopy, um, RSI, fiber optics. Do you, does your agency carry a bougie? You know, review the literature. If you're not familiar with the bougie, there is great literature that um, the bougie increases first pass success rates of intubation in all levels of provider that are intubating. So how do we use this? So what I would propose just based on this study and having talked to some of my EMS physician colleagues is if the patient has zero of these five risk factors, I would intubate as your protocol dictates. If they have one, you can intubate, but I would have your adjuncts ready and have help ready. If they have at least two, you really need to convince yourself why this person needs to in, be intubated. I would have, consider, can they be given a supraglottic? Can you await a critical care paramedic or an air ambulance that has these other resources available like video laryngoscopy or RSI? And then if they have over three, it's kind of the same. So does this patient need to be intubated? So this is kind of one of the huge questions that I'm not gonna really get into here. Um, should we be intubating in the field at all? Again, there's not a set answer. You've seen one EMS agency, you've seen one EMS agency. Every place is different. Um, the populations are different, the resources available, the team, you know, the team makeup is different. The agency I work with is dual paramedic. That's very different than this study agency that was all paramedic EMT. Is it a tiered response? Do two EMTs show up who have to call a paramedic, who have to call, you know, those kinds of things. Those all affect the decisions. All I would say is whichever side of the spectrum you're on about pre-hospital intubation, I would say two things. One, there is good literature that intubating pediatric patients in the field is associated with worse outcomes. There's a huge study out of Texas and out of Arizona that have repeatedly shown that in huge groups. And then the other thing I would say is, regardless of where you stand on this, 
in my mind, EMS providers intubating or not, it's not based on competence. It's not based on their medical knowledge. When I was in paramedic school, I graduated paramedic school having more experience practicing intubation than I did in medical school. And so the skills are taught, if anything, it's focused on more in EMS school than in medical school. But what's different is the reps. So in residency, I intubated probably almost 200, 300 people, and I'm very comfortable with it. As a paramedic, I think I probably had less than 100. And I would say, again, the, the um, it's probably changed a little bit, but they did a survey a few years ago of the average intubations of a community ER physician. And so, again, this is varied from a tiny critical access hospital all the way to downtown New York City. So the numbers are skewed, but they found that about the average is 10 a year, 10 intubations a year from an ER physician. They found, again, with a huge spectrum of types of agencies, that the average number of intubations for an EMS provider is less than one. And so, again, while you graduated school with a better understanding and better muscle memory, if you're not doing the reps, you lose that skill. And so if you don't have a way where you are regularly doing it, then I understand the argument about giving alternatives, especially when we see that the alternatives work. And so in our agency, we do not intubate first line without some caveats. There are some times that it's indicated and our cardiac arrest numbers using superglottic airways after some passive ventilation are very promising and very in line with the evidence around the country and around the world where this is being done. So, if you're in an agency where you feel like your reps are way down and you're not able to intubate, I still think it's a skill worth having. And I think you should work um, within your agency with your local training centers, your local hospitals, the emergency departments, operating rooms, anesthesia departments, just ways to get your hands on patients. I know with the pandemic and all that, that kind of throws a wrench and everything. And it depends on the dynamics with different EMS schools and all that. But I think it's really important to find a way to get the reps so that when the time comes and you're the one to do it, there's no doubt. So I just wanted to quickly review the two other big studies going on just that are kind of relevant to the same discussion. So this is an advanced airway intervention for pediatric cardiac arrest. This was a systematic review and meta-analysis. So this was searching a database for studies that fit the criteria for what they were looking for. So the objective of this study was to assess the use of advanced airway interventions compared with bagging alone in pediatric cardiac arrest. So for them, advanced airway meant endotracheal tube or supraglottic airway. And again, as you can see, this is a much more recent study where we found that supraglottic and intubation are essentially the same thing and should be treated as such. So they used 14 studies they kind of pooled all the data and then did a big meta-analysis, meaning they analyzed the data from all 14 of these studies. And there were various different types of studies that I won't really get into the different types, but they had to meet a bunch of criteria. And so all the studies are high quality. So the outcome they were looking at was survival to hospital discharge with good neurologic outcome. Because again, it's no longer about, do you, is your heart beating when you leave the hospital? It's we, the public and the medical community agrees neurologic function is really the meaningful recovery that we're all looking for to measure. So they were comparing groups of those that got an advanced airway, those that were bagged alone, and compared with the, the outcome of survival to hospital discharge. And they found better outcomes achieved with bagging alone versus either intubation or supraglottic airway. And then in the few studies that were head-to-head -head of supraglottic versus intubation, they found um, that the supraglottic groups were favored over intubation. Now, the overall certainty of this evidence is low because, and the reason it's low is even though they had tons of numbers, because it's 14 different studies with different system designs, there's some limitations just inherent to that that they can't break down, so it has to be considered low evidence. But it is undeniable evidence that, um, as we talked about before, in pediatric cardiac arrest, advanced airways are not associated with positive outcomes. There's no survival benefit when you intubate a coding PEDS patient. There are other priorities to have at that time. And then lastly, the other study to talk about um, is from 2019. It's pre-hospital advanced airway management for adults without hospital cardiac arrest. And this was a nationwide cohort study. <clears throat> 
So a cohort study is you divide your population into two groups and um, you start at time zero moving forward towards an outcome and then along the way you're looking you're measuring exposures of a certain variable so then at the end when you look at the groups that have come to this outcome however you've defined it you go back and see what variables that they were exposed to may have been associated with that outcome so this group was looking at they want to determine survival associated with advanced airway management compared with no advanced airway management in adult out of hospital cardiac arrest patients. So this was a nationwide population based registry in Japan. And so basically all um, patients in cardiac arrest, they go into this registry. So all patients, because of just how their medicine is in that country, it's all database driven. And so they're able to have every single cardiac arrest patient. And so consecutively, adult patients were separated into two cohorts, those with a shockable rhythm and initially and those without. And so then within that group, they decided, okay, if you have a shockable rhythm, some had an advanced airway, some didn't. Non-shockable rhythm, same thing, to see what was the survivability here or a hospital discharge at one month. So in the shockable rhythm, an advanced airway did not change survival. It was about 20% survival, which is pretty comparable to our national um, survival rates with a shockable rhythm. And then in the non-shockable rhythm, advanced airway patients had better survival, um, about 2.3% versus 1.8%, which are again, pretty comparable numbers. And so they found that um, the reason for this presumptively is that we know that PEA and asystole are more often than not, not primarily cardiac issues. And so VTAC, VFib will eventually degrade into asystole and PEA, but a primary non-shockable rhythm on, our, on arrival is more often non-cardiac, whether it's a structural issue, toxicologic emergency, anoxic injury, you know, anything else like that, sepsis. Um, so often an advanced airway is, okay, is more helpful presumptively because you're not treating ACS, you're treating something else. The point of this though, universally, is that they found that at the, at the overarching scale, the advanced airway did not change the outcomes because even here, they had better survival in the non-shockable group, but it's still a pretty dismal survival rate. And so, Again, as our previous literature has shown, go back to the cardiac arrest podcast if you need more info. Airway is not the focus in cardiac arrest. In the shock rhythms, focus on defibrillations and compressions. And I'm not going to go any farther than that because there's an hour discussion about that. So in conclusion, the biggest thing here is we have to be experts in the airway. We control the airway. We literally hold patients' lives in our hands with our airway management. And so successful management is based on preparation, technique, and experience. So optimize your success. This trial offers five factors in combination that should be added to your airway evaluation and overall patient evaluation. That's another tool on your belt to help you determine how to best treat a patient's airway. Don't forget about your adjuncts, your alternatives, and what is best for the patient. Leave your ego at the door. Make sure you have the right people coming or with you. And we've got to start changing the culture to encourage EMS to use all the airway tools and not just rush to their laryngoscope and think of everything else as something they just use when they fail. Um, thanks for listening. Hope this was useful. Here's some references if you need, and we will see you next time.